Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ben Powell, I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech, and I welcome you to our first lecture of the 2024-25 public lecture series. Uh, we've got three of them planned for this fall, uh, and we'll have some more in the spring, of course. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, just to uh, highlight what we have coming up, we have John Hasmus from Georgetown University, who will be here October 15th to talk about the common law of liberalism. And we're bouncing all over campus here this semester. We're here today, we're at the student union for this one, and then I think we're in Rawls for the last one, which will be Todd Swicky from George Mason University of what is the rule of law and why it is important. But first, it's my pleasure and privilege today to introduce Nicholas Kachanowski to you. Uh, Nicholas Kachanowski is an associate professor of economics at UTEP, and he is also a senior and he's also the director of their Center for Free Enterprise at UTEP. He's also a senior fellow with the American Institute for Economic Research. He's a graduate of a PhD at Suffolk University, where I had the pleasure of working with him and actually supervising his dissertation when he was a graduate student there before I came to Texas Tech. Uh, Nick, before he went to UTEP, was teaching at Metro State University in Denver. He's the author of more than 50 scholarly studies in academic journals and author or co-author of five books, including <coughs> Dolorization Una Solución para la Argentina, his latest, which is the dollarization plan for Argentina that the current president, Millet, held up when he was running for office and said, this is my plan to dollarize our economy. Uh, Nick's also a native of Argentina, and I'm sure will have a unique perspective on us for us on what I think is one of the more interesting reform efforts trying to happen around the world today. Please join me in welcoming Nick. Thank you, Texas State, for having me, but thank you for spending some time here with, with me today. Uh, the topic we have is well, can we lay the new Argentine president uh, bring Argentina back to prosperity? Uh, do you know who Milei is? Raise your hand. Yes, you all do. You want to hear. That's him. <laughs> That's a real picture. That's not AA generating anything like that. That's a real picture of Milei dressed with his uh, super CEO uniform, I guess you call it, <laughs> Captain and Cap. So we elected this guy to run the country. So to understand or have an idea if Millet or what he's doing can be a solution to Argentina's no history of economic troubles, we need to understand what the problem is first. So the first thing I do is to spend a few minutes, not too long, <coughs> in a brief history of success and failure in Argentina. So we have an idea of what the size of the magnitude of the problem. Then we can talk about the context in which Millet rises to become president. And the final part, the most probably interesting one is, is Millet uh, Argentina's solution? What is he doing? And what he's not talking about, what he's doing. So you know, have a reality check on, on Millet if you want. So let us start with a short history of economic success and failure in Argentina. I'm going to go back to the old days of the country. We had a generation of 1837. This was a, a group of intellectuals, of, if you want, that they started in Europe. They were familiar with Adam Smith, John Locke, the Scottish Enlightenment, all these ideas. And back in Argentina, they were in positions of you know, influence in society, and the government, and they drafted the institutions that founded Argentina when it finally became a country independent from Spain, and they secured their borders, and so on. So this generation that was educated in these ideas translated into the Argentine Constitution of 1853. The, if you want me to put it in this terms, the free market constitution of Argentina. Out of that institutional framework, you have the golden age, if you want, the, the rapid growth uh, of this country. At some point, of course, things start to go a little off. Uh, and one reason is that once the country establishes its borders, the next political generation finds something they think is a problem. There is no such thing as an Argentine. Look at this country. People from all over the world. They speak a different language, different religious beliefs. But they can hardly speak to each other. We don't know what being an Argentine means. So they created the policy to build the Argentine. 
That was implemented through the educational program. So you go to school, you know, it's going like to the army, you have to wear the uniform, play allegiance to your flag. You have all these romanticized stories about San Martin and all the Argentine prosers. But that creation of the Argentine comes with a strong nationalistic component. We Argentines, we know we are the best. And if you don't believe that, you're wrong. So you have generation after generation after generation of this educational program through your you know, Argentines. And at some point, these new generations become the new leaders of the country. And that's where you have the rise of Peron. And one of the things that uh, allows Peron to happen is, in 1930, there is a coup in Argentina, and the Supreme Court says that coup is valid, is legally correct. And that opened the doors to a series of coups in Argentina. Peron started his career overthrowing a government when he was in the army. When Perón takes office, he gains enough political power to reform the constitution, and uh, if I can put it in these terms to emphasize the point, now you have the non-free market constitution in Argentina. And that starts to have, of course, economic consequences down the road. So now we are in stage five. We have captain and cap. Is this a new opportunity for Argentina, or this will become a new failure? This is not the first time Argentina tries to do good reforms. So if you summarize this process, you have a cultural change, this creation of the Argentine. This explanation I'm giving you is one of the most common that you can find in the studies on Argentina of why things started to go wrong. That belief, that cultural change, eventually becomes an institutional change. The Supreme Court validates the court. You have a new constitution. And through that, you have a new political set the rise of Peron, a new constitution, and so on. So it goes from a cultural change to institutional change. And it's important to understand where the, the stages of these changes. Because if we want to find, uh, sorry, before I go to, to that, uh, let me show you the effect that this can have. In this graph, we have, in the vertical axis, the ranking, the world ranking of income per capita. Since 1880, I think, until 2019, or something like this. That great shaded area, if your country is in that area, you're in the top 20% country with highest income worldwide. The country Argentina likes to compare itself is Australia. Similar history, similar flow of immigrants, similar natural resources. Good reason or not, Argentina likes to compare themselves with Australia. If you look at Australia, it's consistently doing pretty good. If we are Argentina, it's doing pretty good for some time, but at some point, if I can mark it, you can probably see it. Right? Over here, there is a break point. Argentina starts to fall in the ranking. Your income per capita now is not as good as before. Countries, and more and more countries, become wealthier than you. So what you have in Argentina is not a big crisis. It's a change in your trend of how you are doing with respect of the world. So if you want to find a solution to that, it's not just about having good monetary policy, it's you need to fix that trend. You need to make it go up. For that, you need a strong institutional shock. You need a good set of institutions and ones that are credible, that are going to last, you know, beyond the government we have now. So this is a big cost. Argentina went to be in the top 20% income countries to keep falling. This is not good performance. So, the process we describe, if, you, if, if what made Argentina go bad became stable, and that's why Argentina keeps going to be bad, if you want to fix that, how that process happened, but we want to revert that for you know, a good outcome. So you want to go from a cultural change to a belief change to transform that into an institutional change. Your beliefs, those are your rules. You transform that into the institutions, that becomes a political change. That would be a good solution because this is rooted on the society's belief. It may not be sustainable if you try to do it backwards. You start with a political change, you try to impose an institutional change, but if that doesn't translate into a cultural change, this may not be sustainable. It may be very easily reversed. 
we are talking about a country where the government itself doesn't follow its own laws. And nothing happens. Right? That's the degree of institutional decay. So this is a, a you know, big summary, small summary, <laughs> a summary of uh, why people say in Argentina things went wrong. So, was the context more recent in which Millet, uh, Millet takes office? So, in 2001, you might remember this, we had a very big Argentine crisis, it's called the Argentine Great Depression. In just one year, GDP fell like almost 10%, and employment went off, off the roof, and so on. Uh, and so, this was very shocking for, for society. And Individuals took some lessons from this. They might be the wrong lessons, but these are the ones they took. One of them that neoliberal reforms of the 1990s, they don't work. Look at the size of this crisis. What other proof you want? The way they describe this is, you know, you are doing wrong, and the government is in this store with all this delicate China, and they leave the store running and throwing everything away. Well, if, if you live off a bad situation making things worse, that's not going to help. Uh, but the lesson the public took is free market reforms don't work. So if you find then we have this huge crisis. Free market policies are highly corrupt. The 1990s government was known for being highly corrupt. So you see, you free markets, what you want is just to do corruption and steal from the people and so on. That message was taken. That's one of the lessons. Economic growth takes place at the expense of blue-collar workers and low-income households. Basically, if you do these policies, bad income distribution. International organization of financial institutions, FMI, the US, etc., they are bad actors, meaning they are evil. They are bad people, not they're inefficient, right? they are bad people, we don't want to deal with those things. <laughs> the government must do something. This sounds familiar? Whatever you do, do something. Right? And that's usually not good, but you have to do something. You create the crisis, I don't understand that, but you need to save us. This is a perfect setting for the rise of a new populist regime. And that's exactly what we see in Argentina after the 2001 crisis. So here we have the president since 2003 up to today. So we have four years of Nestor Kirchner, and then eight years of Cristina Kirchner, his wife. Nestor and Cristina plan was to take turns to become president so that they are not affected by constitutional limits on the presidency because as long as they are not continuous, you can be re-elected endless times. Uh, after the second term, Cristina is over because Nestor passed away. Uh, she can run again. Uh, the candidate for the Kikerik, and I want you to remember his name, Daniel Scioli, he runs against Macri. Macri wins. And that becomes a central layer, central rise, everyone wants to see it, you know, opposition to the Kikaristas. He's in office four years, another big economic crisis, he loses the election to Alberto Fernandez, the Kikarista country. Alberto Fernandez is known to be the worst president in Argentine history. Think about how difficult that is for a moment. <laughs> Not easy. And he slammed that down. Now, when his term is over, he loses. And that's when uh, Millet takes off. So, uh, you know, in, in a couple of months or four months or at the end of the year, we'll be in office for one year, we'll have three to go in his term. In Argentina, you have four year presidential terms. You can run again one year consecutively, that's your limit. If you wait for one term, you can run again. So, this, I mean, count those here. That's like, I'm not good at math, but that's something like 12 years of Kirchneristas in the government. That's a lot of time. You can do a lot of damage in 12 years. So to, to have an idea of the impact on a free market environment, this is the economic film of the World Index. Uh, in the orange line, you have the score that goes from 0 to 10. The closer you are to 10, the more a free market you are. And the blue bars are tracking the ranking of Argentina worldwide. And that's the axis on the uh, left side. 
So you see that down arrow, that's when the populism takes office again in Argentina. The Argentine rankings start to fall very rapidly. And in the last few years, if you open the economic freedom of the World Report, and you go to all the countries listed, and you say, which are the 10 least free market countries in the world? North Korea, Cuba, uh, I don't know. You can get those names. Argentina is there. Bottom 10. It only takes out of the bottom ten a couple of years in the Macri administration. So the economic environment is very non-market friendly. See you. You will look at the map of the countries, well, Uganda is more free than Argentina, that can be right. That, that, that was the level of how much Argentina fell in this world. So how is the economy doing? This is a monthly indicator of economic activity. Think of this uh, if you want as a monthly GDP measure. It starts in 1998. You see there are the 2001 prices, economic activity here for like 12%. Then you have an upside in the cycle of the price of commodities. Argentina is doing great because it depends a lot on these prices. You have the 2008 prices there with a fall of 11%. The economy recovers and then it stagnates. The economy stagnated for more than 10 years and is still stagnating. You have close to 14, 15 years of an economy that is not growing. Think about that for a moment. More than 10 years, your economy is not growing, and in per capita terms, it's falling. What's going on with inflation? You ready? It's not an electrocardiogram. <laughs> this is real inflation rate for Argentina starting in 1945 when Perón made the constitutional reform. Look at the numbers in your access. Look how big that is. For how, well, you get it wrong, right? So, if you go from 1945 to the end of 2023, your yearly inflation rate is 62%. You live in a country that consistently has, in average, 62% inflation. It's super high and it's super volatile. This is not a trick. If you remove the actual inflation years, it's 60% a year, the average. Right. This is, you cannot work with this. Right. And at the end, you have how inflation is going up, and at the very end of Alberto Fernandez's presidency, it starts to skyrocket. And that's the reason why there were talks in Argentina, we may have like an inflation again if we don't put this under control. So, what explains, I think, and I think many people will agree, the rise of the late the presidency? Well, the Cambiemos coalition of Macri government failed when they were in office. We are not an option anymore. You gave me a very big crisis and you give me a letter from Nandes as president. Sorry, you are not a good option. I want something else. Millet is an outsider who speaks against the political case. That's his expression. My take, and some people may disagree, my take is that what attracted more voters was the anti-politician rhetoric than the free market rhetoric itself. I can imagine himself giving a very similar rhetoric against the evil corporations and people will still align against him because they are tired of what's going on. It's not so much about what you offer. But uh, that's my interpretation of seeing how he talks and the reactions. Mind you, the left in Argentina also has an anti-government rhetoric as well. If he had a lucky win, maybe, the Kirchneristas, when Millet was running, were promoting his, his campaign to steal votes from what, who they thought was their most important contestant, the Cambiemos candidate. If you look at Millet's uh, office, he adopted the plans from Cambiemos, the ministros from Cambiemos. Where was his team? So it sounds like, I don't know if I'm going to win, but I need to run. Oh my god, I win. What do I do? There's a good plan from my opposition. I'm going to take it. I need someone to execute it. Here, just show my team. Right? The omnibus law that he says is going to reform Argentina, that wasn't drafted by him. That was drafted for Cambiemos. A loss of young population that have no hope in Argentina. 
more than 10 years of stagnation, inflation going up. If you are born in 2000, all your life experience is populism, stagnation, inflation. That's it. You are tired and you don't have a hope moving forward. You are angry, you need to, you know, redo the whole thing. Now, Millet is not the only uh, outsider, right wing, if you want to describe it that way, some people do. Uh, to the pink tide, the rise of less populism in Latin, in Latin America and other countries. Trump is an outsider, Bolsonaro is an outsider, Melon is an outsider, and so on. So he's not the only one coming from a non political career to all of a sudden, well, you're a president now. Uh, he political career in like 40 years, and that's how long it took him to become president. So I wanted to give you some context of what's going on in Argentina, have a little understanding of where these basic problems are, and the context in which Millet rises to the presidency. So the next part is, okay, what is he doing? And what I see, I describe as to Millet. So, when he takes office, he receives an economic disaster. And there are serious conversations about I think inflation may happen again. Uh, I also mind you, Argentina, I think, is the only country that suffers hyperinflation without having to go to work. That's how bad we are doing monetary policy. Um, how much support he has? Well, the presidential election went to a second round, and he gets 55% of votes. And those votes, you can split them in those that vote for you and those that vote against the other guy. Not the same thing. So who voted for Millet? Those who voted for him in the first round. <coughs> That's 30%. I describe that as a strong support. It doesn't matter what Millet does, there's going to be Millet forces. The other 25, in the previous round, vote for someone else. So now when I need to choose between you and the Kirchnerista, I choose against the Kirchnerista. I'm calling that the weak support. I don't know how much patience they have if you don't deliver what you promise. So he had two ways out of this monetary mess. One was a permanent monetary reform, dollarization, which uh, is uh, the book that I mentioned, that was seriously discussed. My co-author in that book was mentioned by Blake to become the next and last central bank president in Argentina with the mission to dollarize, shut down the central bank, and be done with all this. That didn't happen. That was not the path taken. The other way out was a transitory plan to another monetary reform. That was his, the Caputo plan. Caputo is the Minister of Economia. Uh, and this was a path taken. So some of the things we need to understand is what Caputo is doing and to what extent this is sustainable or not. So Caputo plan phase one. That's how they talk. Depreciate the exchange rate roughly from 400 pesos for $1 to 800 pesos for one dollar. That happened in December. That's a massive depreciation. That needed to happen. I'm not saying why you do that, but it needed to happen, it happened. They're going to set a crawling peg of 2% monthly. What this means is once you hit the new exchange rate, it's going to grow 2% every month. The problem is if this is not aligned with the mass inflation rate, it's just going to break down. Cash spending, move central bank bonds from the central bank to the treasury. So when you, in a country like this, you implement a new economic plan, you need to ask for this to some belief system. Sometimes we call this Yanko. Why you believe this? What's going to you know, make you stick to the plan? There are two anchors here. Fiscal balance. Stop printing money. So some results and concerns, and by the way, the concerns I will be sharing with you are shared by many economists. This is not just me uh, looking at this stuff. So if you look at the treasury balance, it's going to show you some surplus in general. That fast. How does that? One way is they're postponing payments. I can go back home and tell my wife, this month we made money, I didn't pay the bills. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, I can show you a surplus, but that's really going to change. 
unilateral default and restructuration with the energy sector. The government owes a lot of money to the energy distributor company. Uh, you know what? I owe you hundred dollars. For every hundred dollars I owe you, you're gonna take this one for fifty dollars. And uh, that wasn't a question. You're gonna take it. Thank you for your contribution. This was a problem because when this was known, there was a lot of concerns. Wait, you are just taking office and you're starting by violating these contracts and property rights this way? What's next? That's not my concern. That was a whole concern back then. Pension and social program real tax. And I'm gonna show you a number in a, in a few moments, but a big part of the uh, spending cut is your rate I guess. We have a, a current program in Argentina, not a 401k, that doesn't exist anymore. So it's all social transfer. You don't get your inflation adjustments. Thank you for your contribution. Now, if you look at the fiscal reserve, not on a cash flow base, how much money moved, but how much money should have moved, the numbers don't look that good. They look some surplus with a downward trend. And that's part of the concern. Is this fiscal balance going to remain or not in time? So let me show you how this was the fiscal the, the spending was done. Now, so here in blue you have social welfare programs. Uh, I can't read this very well, but um, transfer to the private sector, transfer to the uh, public sector, and so on. Uh, this is measured in pesos, so you know in the act you have five million, million, million pesos. I don't know, maybe that's worth hundred dollars. It's hard to tell. Uh, but the interesting point is in the other graph. So where is the cut coming from? Fifty percent of the cut is coming directly to the private sector. I will give you your pension payment or the inflation adjustment. I will give you the subsidy for the you know, transportation <coughs> services and so on. A direct cut to the private sector. The other 49.7% uh, is a direct cut to government spending, which of course has an indirect effect on the private sector. So, fine, this is the opposite of what Milese was going to do, but the point is if you have such a big presence when you cut the spending on retirees, companies that need the subsidy to remain on business and so on, will they keep giving you support? Or that will support will start to turn on you? And if that turns, what's your net political move? You keep the same fast, or you say, no, okay, I cannot lose support, I'm gonna give you the money again. And remember that in Argentina we have inflation because government spends more money than they receive, and that becomes a, the source of inflation. So there is, a, I think, a rational concern here even how the spending is being cut, will this be politically sustainable or not? And we won't know until he needs to make a decision about this. Okay. So, is this approach credible? For a successful policy, you need two things. Policy needs to be consistent, but also needs to be credible. If it's consistent but not credible, it won't act. So the credibility problem is, is, is an important one in Argentina. Another challenge is, he may say, uh, the Lace Party doesn't have a strong presence in Congress. And Congress has been debating, and now they are about to, uh, to pass laws where they mandate the executive to increase spending. So now the president, Milay, needs to decide, I accept this, or I, I'm not sure what the term is in, in English, when the president receives a law and he says no. He did that, I think, this Monday. So that goes back to Congress, but Congress can insist and say no, you have to do it if they have two thirds of the vote. And guess what? They do. That law was passed with more than two thirds of the vote. So unless he gains new support, that may be reverted and then he has no choice. He needs to make that spending. So the political weakness in Congress is not a minor detail. It's not like, oh, you are the bad people, whatever. No. They're, they are forcing you to do this. You are the executive. So you have to execute. Um, and, well, Congress is, you know, toying around with other uh, uh, laws that may affect the fiscal balance. So an important lesson here, I think, is when you look at budget cuts, you have to wait to do that. One is with the change zone, right? It's, he became famous for going to his political campaign with the change. That's why I you know, cut the spending. 
Another way is if you are a physician and you take your scalp off and you think about how, when, and where your cutting is spending so that this becomes structural, more permanent. Because if I apply the chainsaw and I cut the, spend, the, uh, you know, the payment to the rate of ease, that may be back to me. And the spending will go up again. I didn't make any structural change. I just impose an inflation tax on these people and they're not taking it anymore. Okay, so that's on the fiscal side. On the other big problem was inflation rate. Inflation is going down. Why? I think an important reason is that there were two temporary, not permanent, temporary shocks to inflation. I mean, you should expect inflation to go up and then go down. So one of them is called Plan Platita. By the Kirchnerista presidential candidate who at the time was the Minister of Economy. So what he did, pay central bank, print all those pesos, give it to me, I'm going to spend them so I have more chances of being elected. Very straightforward Latin America clientelism. That was a lot of money. But when the plan platita is down, you should expect the inflation rate to go down again. The other shock was the depreciation of the exchange rate in December. You should expect that to make the inflation rate go up and then go down again. We also have price controls with the left. And a clear case was the health providers. The first move is with the regulate your health providers, uh, your market, health providers weren't allowed to raise their tariffs with the inflation coming on, so they adjusted not all the inflation they missed, but some extent, uh, their prices to catch up with the missed inflation. And that rise in the health prices was more than the inflation rate. So the government say, no, no, no. You are doing a cartel, that's illegal, you need to cut down your prices and you cannot raise them moving forward more than inflation. That was with Caputo Milet. So you have some price control on some sensitive prices and going on as well. Uh, we don't see central bank transfers to the Treasury, but that's also true since uh, September 2023. Uh, and so if you think about the fiscal challenge, if the fiscal deficit comes back, what will happen with inflation expectations? So if Milet has to step back on that pressure, on the political support, that may affect what the market thinks inflation will be, and that can put pressure on the central bank as well. So this is how the monthly inflation rate looked like in Argentina since January 2023. The light blue color, that's the Kirchnerista government, that's the color we use. <coughs> that uh, purple is uh, under the Milet's government, that's uh, the core of his political party. Uh, and you can see that before the Plan Platita shock, the average monthly inflation rate was around 8%. And it goes up a lot, up to 25%, I think. That's a temporary shock. And then it starts to go down, as you expect. And then eventually it goes down to 8%. And it remains now, it's expected to be around 4%. Remember, the current pay was 2%. Right? Uh, so this was an expected victory. If Massa were to win the, president, uh, the presidential office, we would expect, at least for the first month, to also see this downward trend in inflation. Okay. I think a couple of months ago, there was started to be some pressures in the exchange rate markets, you know, the, the illegal exchange rate going up and, and all these problems. And so one concern is that uh, they made a mistake. They printed too much money. So in this graph, you have the accumulated expansion of the base money in January, February, March, up to July. So if you look at July, it's the accumulated base money expansion up to July. So that's 2021, 20, 2022, 2023. You ready for 2024? Boom. What do you think will happen with inflation? Again, the credibility of what's going to happen moving forward is important. Now, the government might correctly say, hold on, this is what's going on. The central bank had issued all these bonds, the nominated in pesos, and we need to clean that and move it to the treasury. That's what they want to do. 
So the central bank is no, not going to renew those bonds anymore. So if you are a bank who hold these bonds, you don't renew the central bank bonds, they give you the pesos. What do you do with those pesos? Now you buy a new bond issued by the treasury. So you get a new bond, you give the pesos to the treasury. Where are those pesos going? To the treasury's bank account. Where is that bank account? In the central bank. So you see base money going up significantly because of that movement. The money is going from the central bank to the bank, to the treasury, to the treasury's bank account at the central bank. So it's not in the market trying to buy stuff. Okay? So one way to test if this is too much or not is to see what's happening with <coughs> currency in circulation. The money in the hands of the public. So we have the same graph. That's the accumulated expansion of the currency circulation for 2023, 20, 21, 22, 23, you ready? 24. So, unless you think that in Argentina the demand for pesos went up 88%, that's probably a problem. And that's why they're having problems in the exchange rate market. And there's a lot of discussion and pressure. You need to depreciate, you need to devaluate your exchange rate again. All you want in December is gone. And your problem pay is not enough because your inflation rate is not going down to 2%. Okay. So the monetary anchor, remember we mentioned too, the fiscal and the monetary anchor. The monetary anchor was the first one to go. So I think, again, it's a rational question for analysts, potential investors, economists, and so on, to ask, will the same coin anchor go, or will it stick? You already give up one. So what will happen with the second one? OK. Phase one, because of this mistake, started to have some issues. So Caputo and the central bank president announced phase two. So now we are going to use central bank reserves, which are the dollars that the Argentine central bank has, to sustain that exchange rate. So we have too many people trying to buy dollars. If I don't increase the price, I need to sell more dollars. So instead of accumulating dollars that I need to pay the sovereign debt, I'm going to use that to maintain the scrolling peg at 2%. Also, if I don't have enough dollars, I cannot remove capital constraints. In Argentina, you are a law abiding citizen. You are paid in pesos, you want to buy a few dollars for your saving account, not allowed. It's illegal in Argentina to buy dollars, you need special permits. So to lift that, the government wants to have more dollars in the central bank in case they have a flood of pesos going to the exchange rate market. But now they're saying, I'm not going to accumulate more reserves. Actually, in the press conference, the president of the central bank, who didn't know his voice until then because he doesn't speak much, he said, we expect to lose reserves in the second half of the year. This was an open challenge to the IMF. And I don't have to be a fan of the IMF, but Argentina wants money from the IMF. So if you want money from the IMF, you don't go against the IMF. So they're not happy with this. But something the IMF doesn't like is when they give money to Argentina, and Argentina uses those dollars not to fix their problems, but to maintain an exchange rate out of equilibrium. You know who was the last person that did that? Ministro Caputo during the Cambiemos administration. So the person in charge of going and asking money again for EFMI, someone who ended in background with the, uh, sorry, IMF. Uh, Big difference. <laughs> in Spanish, it's Fondo Monetario Internacional. So men doesn't know that sometimes I refer about the free market institute of the IMF. <laughs> so the result, nobody is expecting that the central bank is going to be accumulated as reserves as needed to remove all these uh, all these constraints. And the announcement was, and this was credible, the capital constraints are here to stay for the foreseeable future. It was going to be removed in January during the campaign, now it's saying that you don't know when. Okay, so a big plan, a big traction of his uh, campaign was the dollarization plan. Uh, I think there is a chance that still happen. You have two ways to dollarize. One is by conviction, you want to do it. Another one is by necessity, you don't have a choice. 
So if we are in this transitory plan, now we don't know until when. This plan may work out well, the plan may succeed, and what the government is doing is going to a bi-monetary regime. You have the peso and you have the dollar. Uh, another option is that they say, no, we are going to double by conviction. Uh, I don't see that happening. The other option is the plan fails, and Argentina repeats the 2001 crisis, and that's no bueno. Uh, the other option is the Ecuador case, and they normalize because they don't know what to do. That has always been in my mind, if Argentina dollarizes, the most likely scenario quite happen. Now, the problem I see with the bimonetary regime is that it's not credible. Argentina cannot do that in a split. The government doesn't respect its own laws. So, this is very easy to revert if they want. Okay. Uh, the last part I have is a question I get a lot. It's not my favorite topic, but uh, it's important. Is Millet in Argentina the rebirth of a libertarian movement? This is a very complicated topic, a very sensitive topic. Um, uh, it's uh, up to a lot of uh, emotional reactions in my experience when I talk with Argentines, non Argentines. Uh, what I'm going to share, like I did before, is again, sheer concern by men. Things I worry about what may happen other than me. And Millet itself, to some extent. So I think there are two sides of this Millet effect. The Millet effect is this rise of this character. Uh, on one side, uh, yes, yeah, it's true, you have a you know, more younger population interested in free market ideas that otherwise would not have run into these ideas, and now you know, they believe in that, and they want it, and so on. But you also have more rejection of free market friendly individuals that will become like, a supporter of these ideas, and they want no association with it. You look at the Millet environment, and it's, you know, it's, it doesn't uh, transcend. Uh, uh, how do it here? Uh, it's, it's doesn't, it doesn't look a scientific, philosophical doctrine. It looks like a group of fanatics. So some people don't want to be associated with that. So we need to keep that in the trade balance effect, right? You win one, you lose the other. You need to do that both of them. So a result I'm seeing is an increased polarization at least in the Argentine free market movement. What used to be a very friendly environment now is not so fun. If I support Malay and not a hundred supporter Malay, you are like, you know, it's to the cause or something like that. The attitude changed a lot and it became very personal. So now instead of having a group of individuals that feel they are together, it starts to fracture. That's not the good that's not the good outcome. La Libertad Avanza, that's the name of uh, Millet's party, you will imagine being a libertarian party, you will have free market economies in the government. There is none. Where are the free market economies in Millet's government? Where is Carlos Rodriguez? Where is Jorge Avila? Where is Mayan? Where is Emilio Campo? Where is Roque Fernandez? Where are all these guys? And the name, can, the name list can keep going. Countries like Argentina that are such an economic mess, they produce a lot of good economies. <laughs> and we have a good number of free market good economies. They are not in the government. And Millet is in bad terms with all of them. It's not that free market economies in Argentina are in bad terms with each other. Millet is in bad terms with all of them. Again, that's not a good sign. Right? And many people say, I don't want to show this. I'm done. They don't say it publicly, but they do. So who is in the court? I'm going to give you two cases. One is Daniel Scioli. This is the name I ask you to remember. This was a Kirchnerista presidential candidate against Macri. Millet appointed him in the government with the rank of secretary. There is no reason why we could have this guy running the secretary of sports in the court. Who else is in the government? His sister, Karina Millet. Have you seen her CV? It has two bullets. One, fortune teller. <laughs> you want to know what the second bullet is? Selling cakes through Instagram. Now, I understand if someone you trust in the government, you can make a rational explanation for that. That's a different thing of saying this person has the qualification to do that job. Okay, this is the other thing that concerns me, especially moving forward beyond Millet's term, and I'm almost done, and we can do any Q&A or discussion with them. 
So what are the distinctive characteristics of a typical Latin American populism? Call to the leader, propaganda, disregard for Republican institutions, intimidate, bully your critics and dissent, and ask versus you undo your evil rhetoric, rewrite the past, who is the most famous Latin American populist? Peron. Che, 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 che. That's why he's the most famous populist in Argentina. He checked on off the point. Millet. Forget his Millet. And look at him forgetting his the free market, captain and cap. Call to the leader? Absolutely. If you don't see this, I'm sorry you're fine. That's the whole thing. Propaganda? I will give him a pass, but I'm concerned this may change. His political honeymoon is over. He got superpowers in the by Congress. He cannot say anymore, this mess is because of the previous government. Now he owns the results. So the incentives might change, but we can give pass. This regard Republican institutions, I think it's a check. The way he talks about other politicians is not about you as senator, it's about the senator institution, the Congress institution. All his rhetoric is, all institutions you are all back. One of the things he did, is, and I, I, I think it's terrible. Some people may think I'm crazy, but when he's invested as president for the president life, that's like in the US, he delivers a, a speech to Congress because he's speaking to the public, to the sovereign. What does he do? He steps outside Congress, he turns around, he leaves his back to Congress, and he speaks to the people in the plaza. And you can say, yeah, that's a few years of people, all the bastards. But the message that you send is Congress doesn't matter, they have direct money from the people, and Congress is second. That's the issue, I think. And I think the meta message that those attitudes send coming from a president uh, are important. Intimidate, who will create it and dissent? Absolutely, if you follow this guy, I've been subject to that repeated times. I can show you the audience on my phone, how he talks about it. Not nice. Ask for the rhetoric. Really. Learn some Spanish if you have to. He literally said he's morally superior to the others. And I think he might be it. Rewrite the past. Well, you know, before him, all those libertarians, they didn't do nothing. I'm the real revolutionary. And now he thinks, and he says, he's one of the most important libertarian persons in the world. And before in Argentina, all you were failures. No. No, nice you have a form, you have a very strong, you know, free market moment in Argentina. So I think there might be some of that. So the, the danger, I think, what worries me is that one milace is over, we are justifying from a free market politician attitudes, potential degradation of institutions that can be dangerous down the road. I cannot say if Millet does what the Kinerista does because Millet supports free market ideas, then it's good. That, that's the part I think is problematic. So political populism is about your political behavior, not about your economic policy. Okay, so to finish. I think there is a dangerous strategy in Argentina of equating liberalism means Millet, Millet means liberalism in both, both ways. Uh, because if, for whatever reason, this government fails, we're going to have some reaction. You see, once in power, you libertarians are just like the other politicians, like another Peronist. Price control, check, you did. Nepotism, your sister, what are the qualifications? No. Failed policy, well, the government failed. Disrespect for institutional constraints. <coughs> he wants to go over Congress, the way he stands. Appoint corrupt judges to the Supreme Court. I haven't mentioned this. It's one of the most controversial cases. The iconic case of the corrupt judge in Argentina, he's promoting that to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the body that interprets and defends the Constitution. This person is not even a constitutionalist. Double standards. Millet can criticize anyone but no one can criticize Millet. So we are exposing, and say we, libertarians, are exposing themselves to this reaction, especially if they are so open about, yes, Millet, 
Now we cannot say, oh, you know, the socialist like Lenin in Russia, that wasn't really socialist. We never endorsed him. That was him saying he was. But now we have everyone in Argentina saying, that's the free market guy. So now you cannot unconnect from that if this backfires. So these are some of the concerns, and by me, I mean plenty of Argentines uh, looking forward. Uh, and I think it's a good time for me to stop. And let's see any questions, discussions that you may have. Another thing outside.